And let's make sure I can get the slides working. There we are. Okay, you may be surprised. Why? Because most people tell some story about how they came to be, how their people came into being. And all of these stories, they're metaphors. They don't tell us his historical fact. They tell us stories about where we came from so we can make sense of who we are now and get some idea of who we might be. Such stories also help us to understand why we suffer some hardships and why we don't always achieve our aspirations. So the traditional Christian story appeals to very many people because it answers these existential questions of the heart. Okay, we are people of science. In our modern scientific age, we want a story that's true. But in the past century, the archaeologists like Louis Leakey have dug up the skeletons of that true story. You know that human beings came from Africa, but only recently have scientists put some flesh on those skeletons and reconstructed the ways in which our ancestors lived day to day. Now, some recent research in the human sciences, particularly in genomics, has illuminated the human condition and, I think, put some light onto our struggles. And in the last few decades, from genomic research, we have begun to get some real insights from understanding our evolutionary history into who we are and perhaps into who we might be in the future. So let's start with something. So I have these four parts to this talk. I'll start with something that is very familiar to you the deep past. So, here we have uh, some evolution in the United States. So, the, the first part of this human story is well known to educated people like yourselves, but now the genomic data has helped us to see some of these skeletal facts in a new light. We now know that long before the human brain attained its present size, our ancestors, as well as several other hominids, were walking upright. Why is that? Well, during the time of our common ancestor with chimpanzees, Africa was becoming more dry. And our ancestors were stranded in sort of mixed woodland as these jungles, forests dried up. Now, most primates like to eat some meat, but our ancestors seem to have found some unexpected large packages of meat on the plains. Richard Wrangham at Harvard University has amassed evidence for thinking that human ancestors started scavenging more than three million years ago, long before spears and before fire. So lions and other large cats kill antelope and leave their carcasses for later meals. They collect them. If our ancestors were stealing the lunch of the lions, and then running for the woods in order to eat it, then it really would have mattered how they got around. Now, our ancestors' hands also shortened, which enabled them to butcher meat and to carry the pieces back to camp better, and their feet flattened at the same time to enable them to run more efficiently. At the same time, our pelvis became radically shorter to enable us better to walk and to run upright. That short pelvis and our bigger heads is why human birth is so long and hard compared to the quick and easy birth among our cousins, the chimpanzees. So here we see at the upper left a pelvis from almost three million years ago from Lucy. Uh, at the right you see a chimpanzee pelvis, no problem giving birth there. Uh, and at the bottom left, you see a modern human pelvis. Lots of problems because we have to walk upright. Now, all of these changes made for quite a successful genus. Can you see this? If you could have gone back to visit Earth 50,000 years ago, there were at least three and possibly five different species of human beings there were probably still Homo erectus in Southeast Asia, right up here. I think he's pretty good looking. 
And there were the Denisovans in Asia, who were discovered here in Russia. Uh, they are uh, where? L l bottom right there. And maybe I can point. Yes, I have a pointer. There's Denisovans, so they were discovered in Siberia. Uh, the Neanderthals in Europe, uh, who are here. Um, notice uh, he's got a little decoration and he also has lighter skin. And then you may have heard of th this person, the so-called uh, hobbits, the technically known as Homo floresiensis in Indonesia. And then finally our direct ancestors, Homo sapiens in Africa, and maybe just beginning to come out in the Middle East. Their skeletons look very much like ours do today. Now, this situation with five species of human being was actually pretty normal for most of the past four million years. It's been rather unusual for there to be just one human species as there is today. Imagine what it would be like to have five human species now. It would be very complex. Actually, our ancestors came pretty close to coming, becoming extinct because we see in the human genome a much lower diversity of common variants, common genetic variants, than in most other primate species. <coughs> population geneticists estimate that human population went through a narrow bottleneck, perhaps falling just to a few thousand individual people, sometime in the past 200,000 years. The evidence from caves in South Africa suggests that our ancestors lived along the southeast coast of Africa, eating a lot of shellfish, which were rich in omega-3 fatty acids. And that may have made it easier for our ancestors' brains to grow so much larger. Now that is the story many of us know and we also know that our ancestors went on to make tremendous advances in culture and then spread throughout the world. Now, were these people the same as us today? Until recently, in the West, many scientists thought that human evolution had sort of slowed down. However, one of the surprising findings of recent genetics is that evolution seems to have been speeding up in the last 50,000 years. And especially in the last 10,000 years, we think the rate of evolution in the last 10,000 years has been about 10 times the historical rate of evolution for human species and other primates. We think these rapid changes may have been driven by our adaptation to new environments, and especially by our development of new ways of life, new cultures which in turn impose their own pressures. So let's talk about the recent past. And I want to answer a question. We think that evolution has been speeding up because we look at the date of origin of many currently common genetic variants. So how do we know how old a gene is? We can make a good estimate of how old a gene is by looking at the nearby variants on either side of that variant. So new mutations that spread quickly through a population bring along the unique variants on either side. While old mutations have had more time to mix up. So you see here, we start off in meiosis, we cr the, the chromosomes cross over, and we get mix up of some paternal and some maternal genetic variants. The more generations, the more mix-up has occurred. If a gene has very little mix-up, then it's relatively new. So let's talk a little bit about racial differences. One thing that's important to understand is that as our ancestors spent more time in the sun, gathering roots and carcasses, it became important to have protections from the sun's rays. Oh, I meant to stop just for a minute here. Let's stop here. Any questions on so far? Yes. 
I think there's a microphone coming, or maybe you can shout loudly. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Julian, and uh, I just uh, was surprised. Uh, you told about the traditional religion. Yes, the religion is the first. Uh, from what we, 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 we've got some uh, historical amount, let's say, for t uh, 2,000, 5,000 years. But what, is, uh, what does it mean, traditional religion, for you? Because we in Russia now uh, have adopted about 1,000 years ago a religion. This is not our religion. And our traditional religion is totally different. What, what, what do you mean about t uh, traditional religion? I okay. think every religion, from the oldest people up to the more modern religions, for us, they've come from the Middle East. Um, but even our older religions have stories about how the people came to be. So in my country, which is Canada, the people tell the story, the people who lived there before my ancestors came, they told the story about how Raven had played tricks uh, and had created human beings as a kind of joke. So that helped them to understand the vicissitudes of their own life, how things could not ever be quite stable. There was always a universal joke happening. It's not a true story, but it helps them to understand their own lives. And uh, I think that every culture makes up an origin story to explain its own issues. In Egypt, the traditional creation myths all talked about chaos, how chaotic the world was, how troubled the world was, until some pillar of authority was created. And of course, that was the big problem for Egypt, was authority and chaos. So each culture makes up a story to reflect its own issues. One other question? Yes. In other words, maybe all the changes that you call biological are just simply cultural changes in nature, right? Well, I think I can answer that because we see changes in the genes. So, of course, it's a very important question to understand how much change is due to culture and how much is due to biology. One of the most important changes, I think, is that the biology of our brains has changed to allow us to learn culture. So, much change happens by culture now rather than directly on the genes. But genes had to change to allow that to happen. So in other words, we don't have any direct evidence of biological genetic change. Oh, not at all. We have plenty of direct evidence. So in how, do you, how do you register those biological, biological variants or va variances or whatever? In other words, the biological differential, how would that be? Um, testified or whatever, registered in, uh, we look for in scientific terms? We look for new mutations that, uh, so I've, I've explained to you how we get a rough estimate of the date of a mutation. So we look for changes in our genome where we are different from chimpanzees, and we are looking also for ch more recent changes where we are different from each other. And when we're dis uh, let's say, um, considering the last uh, couple of centuries or the last millennium, would we have uh, direct dif uh, uh, evidence of uh, um, genetic, uh, clear genetic change? Uh, can I answer that in about uh, half an hour? Sure. Thank you okay. so much. Okay. One more and then we... Okay. So let's start with out in the sun. Our ancestors spent more time in the sun than the chimpanzees, and they were gathering carcasses and roots. It became important for them to have some protection from the sun's rays, and there are some very old mutations, about 1.3 million years, that deepened the melanin in the skin of our ancestors. Now, much later, when human beings began spreading out of Africa into Europe and Asia, they encountered a colder climate with much less sun. Sunlight is necessary for making vitamin D unless we get it from food, which most of us do not. So scientists think that the ancestors of Europeans and Asians acquired mutations that resulted in 
uh, that blocked or crippled melanin formation. Interestingly, the different mutations occur in Asian people than in European people. Now, we notice here in this picture that the color of skin indicated by the color on the map, or the color of the native people, um, pretty much reflects the amount of sunlight that comes to those places. Just for interest, we think that people started to wear clothes about 170,000 years ago. How do we guess this? Because, uh, again, of genetic studies, but now not on us, there's no gene for wearing clothes. Maybe there is. But we can identify the genes on the lice that live on our skin and live on our clothes. They are different species or different strains and they have uh, diverged from a common ancestor. And we know their rate of mutation, so we can estimate when, they, when certain lice first started to uh, live in clothes as uh, a specialist. We also notice many people here have blonde hair and blue eyes. Uh, this mutation um, arose about 11,000 years ago, not very long at all, in Scandinavia. Um, the mutation for blue eyes followed shortly afterward in a blonde person, and that mutation is in a gene that is physically very close to the blonde mutation. So all of their children had both blonde hair and blue eyes. And that, because they're very close, those two characteristics are often inherited together. These mutations seem to have spread very rapidly. Uh, we are still not sure exactly why these mutations were so helpful to the people who had them. Maybe some of you can tell me. Okay. Um, any quick questions on this? We'll pause for just one more question right now. Yes, over here. Uh, blue eyes mutation occurs uh, even today in some, I don't know, Indian people or yeah, in I Africa. But why they do not spread and this one uh, spread <laughs> spreads so rapidly? This, this is the uh, hard question. So, I'll, uh, so there are many theories. Some maybe they could make better vitamin D. Um, another theory that is... Uh, perhaps popular, is that uh, because the blonde hair seems more attractive to men. <laughs> Some people think that's, that's the case. Okay, let's move on. Uh, now, much of evolution is not visible on the surface, but is in the inside. And there have been many other changes as a result of the new lifestyles that our human ancestors acquired. We human beings eat much more than we need at any one time, whereas most animals, not every animal, but most animals will not eat too much, even if they have a lot of food in front of them. Now, our ancestors lived in the jungle and moved from the jungle, where all the seasons are similar, to the plains, and then far to the north, where the seasons are very different and food may be hard to come by during the winter. They had to put on fat during the times of plenty, the summer, each year, to prepare for the hard times ahead. One mutation that is now so common among Western Europeans that we forget how unnatural it is is that most adult Europeans can drink and digest raw milk, whereas most other people in the world cannot. And that's the normal state. Almost all mammals lose the ability to digest milk sugars after weaning in their early life. However, one mutation on one European ancestor, about 6,000 BC, allowed him or her to drink raw milk as an adult. Such mutations have occurred fairly often naturally in other animals or in humans, 
but they haven't spread because there was no advantage to being able to drink milk. Nobody drank milk or had milk as an adult. But these European ancestors had just started the habit of keeping herds of cattle, and there was a source of raw milk available. And during the long winters of Northern Europe, drinking milk must have meant survival to many people. But the most terrible sculptor of the human genome has been disease. Since the agricultural revolution, human beings have gathered in large groups and transmit disease to each other very efficiently. Furthermore, our ancestors kept herds of animals and often their animal diseases would evolve to afflict us. For example, rinderpest, a disease of cattle, evolved into measles, a disease of human beings. Today we worry about H5N1 bird flu, which may evolve into a human pathogen with just a few steps. Our immune system genes, more than any other genes, show very many recent mutations. And some researchers have speculated that these mutations prime our immune system to be overvigilant here and to uh, be overvigilant and thus have brought on many of the autoimmune diseases and inflammatory processes that cause or aggravate many of our diseases of aging today. And here is a representation of uh, our the main body, our HLA locus, which is the main body of um, immune system genes. And there are many, many long haplotypes here showing that there have been recent mutations that everyone else has died out because of some disease that these mutations have allowed our ancestors to live through. However, there, is, there may be some truth to the older idea that natural selection is losing its power, although only in the very recent past. So scientists at the University of Washington just sequenced 16,000 genes in 2,400 people of various ancestries, and they found almost half a million new, rare variants with roughly 50,000 that were previously known. So almost 10 times as many rare ones as common variants that were previously known. The problem is that many of these variants are uh, interrupting the protein or making the gene non-functional. So many of us carry, we estimate, roughly 100 mutations that would render our proteins, at least that one protein, non-functional. The picture here is from a recently published study of uh, ion channel genes, and it shows each mutation in, each rare mutation in a blue, or if it's double, in red. And you can see that these individuals uh, all have very many mutations. Now, the study was trying to find the difference between the mutations in people with epilepsy and people who were healthy. So, can you guess which one have epilepsy? It's impossible to say, or very difficult to say. In fact, these ones are the ones with epilepsy. These ones are quite healthy controls. So everybody is carrying very many rare mutations. Okay, I think that's that for there. Let's uh, take, let's say, two questions right now, if you like. Either. Anyways, um, if um, uh, genetic mutations are so rife, so widespread, then what do they prove altogether? What do they what? What do they prove altogether? What do I they mean, prove I mean, altogether? Yeah, I mean, just if, if existence in any healthy or unhealthy individual, tons of various mutations or a rare genetic variants, I'm just quoting from what you put over there, then what's the significance of those? Sorry. Yeah, okay. The, I think the significance is that we are accumulating mutations at a fairly rapid rate. Uh, 
most of the time we don't see the problem because we have one healthy copy of a gene and one broken copy of a gene. But it will become, I think, potentially more of a problem if many mutations, uh, if people have mutations in both copies of their genes. So I think the true answer to your question is we're not sure yet, but we are a little bit worried about that. Could you please explain what do exactly these pictures represent? Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's a little confusing, isn't it? So, uh, each column, um, so you can think of each square, each or each uh, diamond represents one person. And each diamond represents 200 genes on that one person. So let me... Um, so each gene is represented by one gray line here. So there's 200 gray lines across like this, 200 gray lines. And along the length of the gene is represented the rare mutations. And the blue is one rare mutation in one copy of the gene. The red is a rare mutation in both copies. Okay? Most of these probably don't make much difference but some of them do. Does that answer your question? Good? Okay. Yes, one more here. What is the reference point for the non-mutated gene? What do you mean the reference? Oh, okay. Like if, if it would be a grain line without any columns on it. Okay, so that would be the reference human genome, which is, if you, if you think of that, it's kind of like the most common version um, at each point, at each point base, so we may have 10,000 or let's say 1,000 bases in a gene. At each point, what is the most common version at that base? So uh, does that make sense? So, you know, if a, if a mutation is rare, we don't count that as the reference. What 90% what of people have, if we can. Well, uh, then you have a problem. Some, some of these, no, these are all rare. So none of, these are all 99%, see, so less than 1% mutations. But the reference genome has a bit of a problem if half the people have one version and half have another version. Then we can't really say which is the reference form. So then we would say perhaps that both are. Yeah. Yeah, I'll sure I'll take one more. Uh, well, and is it uh, possible to cultivate um, some uh, uh, helpful uh, mutations? Is it uh, possible to cultivate um, necessary mutations? To cultivate helpful? them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know any way... Um, the only ways we know to make mutations are to induce random damage to the genome, to the DNA. And uh, that's usually a bad thing. Often it doesn't matter. Sometimes you get a mutation that hits a base that isn't used for anything, anything we can see. And then it doesn't matter. But the only way to cause mutations we know of is to cause damage to the DNA, which is then repaired, but sometimes when it is repaired, it's, there's a mistake. Uh, and that would be a mutation. So um, we don't know how to make just mutations that would be helpful. This would be wonderful if, it were, if we could do this. Maybe someone will discover that. But we don't know any way to do that now. And we can't think that how, how that would be possible. But just wait till the end. I'll say just a few words about the future there. OK, let's move on then. So I work at an institute of psychiatric genetics. So we are mostly interested in the mind and how it is related to the brain by construction in the genes. Um, let's just compare some brains. We humans like to think that our larger brains give us just more raw processing power and that that makes us smarter than apes. In fact, chimpanzees have better short-term memories than we do. In Japan, there is a chimpanzee named Ayuma at Kyoto. He has been trained to memorize numbers, 
And he has beaten every human memory champion. He looks at the screen for half a second, memorizes all the numbers on the screen, and can write them, re reproduce them. No human being can do that. So our bigger brains probably give us some other advantage than just raw processing power. Now, although most of our brain regions are, uh, uh, of our human cortex are large, larger than corresponding areas in an ape's cortex, let me just, some areas have expanded much more than other areas. We human beings have much larger areas devoted to relationships which are inside here, uh, with relationships with other people than apes do, particularly the orbital frontal cortex here and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is underneath here. These are crucial for moral and social decisions. Furthermore, we have very many large spindle cells that draw, make fast connections from these areas to every other part of the cortex. We have many more of these fast connections than a chimpanzee does, which has only a few. So every brain region gets connected with these social and moral areas. Interestingly, there are a few other animals that have these fast long distance connections from the social brain areas to the rest of the brain, and those are dolphins and elephants. These are species with great intelligence. The neuroscientist Antonio Damasio has shown that if those social and moral brain regions are damaged, we don't lose our ability to think or to count or to talk. Rather, we lose our ability to feel morality, to be courteous, and we also lose our ability to make good decisions. So people who have lost these central areas cannot make good use of all of the rest of their brain. Some of the other differences um, are that we see greater density of connections between cells in human beings. And we grow up differently than apes do. A Russian and Chinese study has documented that during early human childhood, there's a proliferation of these connections in the brain, much more so in human beings than in apes. So this is you know, a, a neuron, here is all of the dendrites. There are many connections, thousands of connections here. And human beings have many more of them. Uh, let me. So what we s see here is that the human brains wire themselves much more slowly than those of chimps or monkeys. Uh, you see here the trajectory of activity of one gene in humans, in red, and in blue for chimpanzee and green for monkey. You see that the human trajectory is peaking and growing for this gene involved in synaptic development just at the time when it's decreasing for chimps and for monkeys. This does not prevent the monkeys from learning, but it means that there's a proliferation of connections in the young brain. The result is that when the young ape brains are learning just the things they need to know for survival, such as where to find food or to find water, human brains are learning many things that aren't immediately necessary for survival but are part of their social world. We have a saying in America, monkey see, monkey do, to describe pointless imitation by children or by junior people in a hierarchy of an organization. In fact, human beings copy each other's actions, as this child does, much more readily than monkeys will copy each other. Let me also tell you about a, an experiment devised by Andrew Whitten at St. Andrews University in Scotland. So researchers show both apes and children how to open this box. And the researchers do this with an elaborate ritual first. So they move this rod back and forth, they tap the box, they do all kinds of ritual first that has no function. 
and then at the end, they do the one movement that opens the lever and to get the treat inside, uh, some food or candy that the uh, ape or the child will want. The funny thing is that apes figure out very quickly that just pulling this latch works just fine. And that's exactly what they do. But the human children copy the whole procedure with the pulls and the tapping and all of the ritual actions uh, exactly as the experimenters did. You can find this video on YouTube, if you like, to see it, and you may laugh. But think about how quickly human children learn basic skills, how to open a jar or how to deal with a difficult social situation, whereas chimpanzees or apes take a long time to learn all of their skills. Um, just a second. So this, I think I'm missing something. No. Uh, I think these rapidly proliferating connections, which are clearly not necessary for learning simple tasks, enable some of our complex social skills. To enable us to cooperate, we need to have many uh, basic skills of attention. So let me just... Go ahead. So human children will learn by social interaction, but it's only because we can all pay attention to the same thing. Most animals cannot make sense of human pointing. If we point to something, a chimpanzee will not understand that we mean the chimp to look there. They are not interested in objects with which other animals look at. So much of our early learning depends on this joint attention. And it's because we have joint attention that these kinds of social cognitive processes are the basis for human culture, that we learn by watching or participating much more than ape or monkey children will do. A recent study in Science magazine documented how different humans are from apes and monkeys in how our children will learn from each other by watching and by asking. And joint attention is the key enabler of that knowledge. We learn from each other, and that is the ratchet that brought the rapid growth of human culture. Now, here's a question. Are our minds still evolving? The raw material of evolution is diversity, and we certainly see large differences in people, in behavior, in everyday life. Many human behavioral traits seem to be more heritable than traits among animals. That is, we think that if your parents behave a certain way, it is more likely that you will behave that way. More so than the same behaviors in a rat or a monkey. In our own work in the BrainSpan project, we find large variation between people in the expression of genes which are themselves the most different between human and apes. So we see in people tremendous variation in it precisely those genes which show the biggest difference between humans and apes. Now, does this evolution have any cost? Some researchers suspect that our human mental abilities have been achieved by stretching our brain capacities to their limits, so that maybe some small changes may unbalance our minds. It is perhaps no accident that the genetic variants that are most commonly associated with schizophrenia are those related to synaptic development. So remember, I told you a, little, a few slides ago, that synaptic development genes were among the ones most changed between human and ape. Now, we have indirect evidence that many mental disorders are highly heritable, but we have failed so far to find any common genetic variants that may unbalance our minds. Perhaps there are none. There is considerable disagreement about what the cause of psychosis is. We know that it's very heritable, 
but we don't know why. And perhaps there are epigenetic differences which uh, reflect human experience that may affect the risk for psychosis. So, where are we going? How will we evolve in the near future? I said earlier that humans have a much lower diversity of common genetic variants, but that the recent sequencing results show that we have a very high incidence of these rare mutations that are many of them harmful. And we think that this results from the recent proliferation of human beings because of the expansion of the food supply and because of industrialization. So what will we do, as one of our questioners asked, what does it mean? We will, will we pass on those genes to our children or will we try to repair them? It seems very likely that with the technology of the next 10 years we will try to repair broken genes or at least try to pass good copies down to our children. So I suspect that the next steps in human evolution will be taken together with our technology for genetic engineering. But this technological promise comes with some danger. One of the key things that made us human was our enhanced social intuition and our moral sense. And we are still highly variable in those ways. We are very different from each other. And that is a sign that we are still evolving in those ways. So we must ask ourselves, which aspects of our nature will we pass on to future generations? And these decisions must respect the key processes that have defined our humanity. Thank you for your attention. And I will take some questions now. Okay, lots of questions now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Anna, perhaps. Um, a question about uh, the, just the, the mutations and um, the increase in, in the number of mutations. Uh, during the recent years, has the molecular pattern of evolution changed? I mean, uh, has it become so that they Mm, that there have become more types of, mm, for example, I don't know, translocations or inversions and less type, uh, and uh, less number of another types of mutations? Okay, good question. Uh, so you're asking, have the types of mutations changed in the last little while? I don't think so, but I don't know of any good evidence one way or another. So uh, I, we have, we, I have, I'm not aware of any evidence that there has been a change, but I don't know that anybody has tested that. Our usual assumption is that the same kinds of bi fundamental biochemical processes occur uniformly over time. Now, if we all lived near Chernobyl, for example, perhaps our mutations would be very different. But uh, for most of us, that is fortunately not the case. Okay, yes, question here. Говорили о том, что было бы хорошо, если бы мы могли, допустим, исправлять мутации, там, допустим, передавать нашим потомкам только здоровые мутации. Но не приведет ли это к тому, что мы снизим генетическое разнообразие до нуля, и это приведет к, соответственно, к меньшей устойчивости популяции? То есть мы подгоним все там, допустим, мы признаем нормальным ген, который наиболее распространен в популяции, соответственно, придем рано или поздно к тому, что в результате все будут с одинаковым геномом. И это далеко как бы нехорошо в случае, допустим, каких-то глобальных экологических потрясений, наверное. Yes, that's a... Thank you, translator. Uh, that's a very good question uh, and something that I think we should worry about because we can easily make our own image the way we imagine we should be. So let's say we want everybody to look like a Hollywood actor. This might seem very good to some people, but would probably be a bad thing for the species. Uh, I raised the question at the end not because I think 
I know the answer. But because these kinds of important moral discussions must take place now, before people start to do this in practice, which I think will come within 10 years. I think people will start modifying the genomes of their children within 10 years. And we must start to talk now about what the moral implications of this will be and how this will affect human evolution. So to answer the more specific question, will it be a danger for the species if the diversity is removed? We like to talk about genetic diversity as a guarantor of uh, robustness, that the species can survive a calamity. And that's certainly been true of our, uh, of our diseases. It was only because we had so many variants, so many mutations in the uh, uh, immune system genes that some of them were Enabled, us, enabled our ancestors to survive the epidemics. Uh, it's hard to know what kind of new diversity we will need. We probably, we hope, we won't have too many more epidemics. But do we need maybe new kinds of thinking? Maybe we should have greater diversity of minds. Um, this is a hard question to, to, to answer right now, but this is the kind of thing that I hope we will be able to answer better in the next couple of decades. Okay, Quest what's the next question? Okay. Mark, can we go uh, back to graphs about the brain development of uh, human beings and uh, monkeys? Sure. This one? This one here? Yes. Uh, okay. As I understood, uh, there are two different, yeah, two different uh, graphs of main, uh, human being development, brain development, and the monkey development, yeah? So this is uh, one gene, the MEF2A gene, which um, is involved in synaptic maintenance, and its level of expression over the time course. So this is birth, uh, about one month, three years, 90 years. Uh, so there, if you look at this, you know, on a normal time scale, it looks like this. Uh, and in the monkey and chimpanzee, it sort of looks like that. Yeah, and uh, my first question is, uh, why is, uh, on genetic level, of course, uh, so big different gap between direction of brain development? Okay, the, the first question is actually, um, there's another figure in this paper, which, uh, if you want to look it up, it's, it's publicly available. Um, if you look for that paper, you will see another figure in which they show that the control region for this gene has highly evolved. Many, many changes in the, the base sequence between chimpanzee and human, and that that um, seems to enable the binding of different regulators that cause this gene to be expressed at high levels at later times. Okay. okay. And uh, the second small question, uh, is it true that expression level of the monkeys uh, at the very start and uh, is really higher than a uh, human being? Expression? Yes. Um, this is a little bit surprising, isn't it? Um, remember, we're not, you know, super apes. We don't do everything better. We just do different things than the apes do. Mm -hmm. So, yes, this gene... Uh, is expressed at lower levels during fetal development and only becomes more uh, expressed after birth. And that's really the, the key change. Uh, so and there's a number of genes like this that are um, important for the brain development of both apes and humans, but that are expressed later in humans. Okay, one more question. Uh, my question is about the global distribution of our species. Uh, <coughs> Uh, what do you think, uh, whether it's uh, just uh, the result of economic and cultural evolution or genes uh, uh, have played some role in the adaptation uh, to uh, different climatic and landscape uh, uh, conditions and uh, uh, whether... Uh, 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 
it is true uh, there is uh, such an idea that uh, uh, it was not uh, the mutations that uh, played the key role in such adaptations, but the gene regulations. Uh, some genes worked in uh, uh, some populations and other genes uh, were repressed. And in different populations, other genes works and uh, 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 those were repressed. Okay, those are two questions. One is about geographic adaptation and one's about gene regulation. So uh, let me quickly answer geographic adaptation. Anna, you also have several questions over here. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll get to them. So I'll take some more water. So about geographic, uh, it's clear that there are genetic adaptations of different people in different lands. Uh, so there, you know, the Asian adaptations are quite different in many, you know, in many dozens or hundreds of places from European adaptations, and some of them seem to be functional. Uh, of course, African people have many, many uh, adaptations to their specific niches. So it's clear that human beings have adapted biologically to many of the new places to which they've gone. Um, second question is about gene regulation. Uh, yes, we think that most of the changes between chimpanzee and human are not so much that our proteins are different because our proteins are about 98.5% identical, but rather that the regulation of those genes is different as we see here. Uh, so we think most of it, so the protein MEF2A is almost the same in humans and in chimps. You could probably put the human version in a chimp and nobody would notice. But the fact that it's, if you, if you started fooling with it so that it was uh, expressed at a high level much later in the chimp's life, then you would see a difference. Скажите, как вы считаете, а вообще будет возможность в ближайшем будущем работать с человеческим геномом, возможно, носить туда какие-то изменения? Я говорю о моральной стороне вопроса и о законах, которые это запрещают. Спасибо. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I think clearly that it will be possible to work directly and engineer the genome. And uh, people will tell you that, oh, we understand what we are doing. So nothing can go wrong, right? We'll just fix a problem. Uh, we've seen lots of history of that. Uh, and I think that uh, you asked about um, the morals and about the laws. Um, I think the morals are what we have to start thinking about now. And I would say, as I ended, that the moral issues we have to respect are what are the, the basics, uh, the basic changes that have made the best part of us. And I think we can ask, well, how can we preserve or maybe enhance those? Uh, but it's, I think, clear that we don't know enough right now. We don't know uh, what genes affect mind function and how. So it's very premature to tinker, to introduce mutations in the hopes that we will change some aspect of our, of our nature. But I think it's very likely that in 10 years, we will know something about this. Can okay. I? I'm optimistic. Uh, Maybe 20 years. Uh, question, one question, in yeah. Russian. Uh, okay. Вот насчет некоторых мутаций достаточно предельно понятно, что сначала возникали, что сначала человек попадал в какие-то условия, не не связаны, ну какие-то необычные, и потом возникала мутация. Но вот конкретно мутации усвоения лактозы в молочной, ну как бы не совсем понятно, что сначала было. Сначала был переход в эпоху сельского хозяйства и возникновение мутаций, соответственно, и остались только те популяции, которые приспособлены были. Или же сначала возникала мутация, и как бы человек уже у него расширялась возможность использования, и он начинал, ну да, начинал приучать сельскохозяйственных животных. Okay, I, I think I can answer that. Uh, I think that there are, this mu kind of mutation is happening all the time. We see changes in gene regulation uh, happening all the time. Um, I think that uh, this mutation must have occurred hundreds or thousands of times in human history, but never spread because there was no advantage. 
it was a little bit of a cost to keep making that enzyme, but very small cost. But almost all mutations die out just by random fluctuations. In this case, because there was already a culture of herding, that mutation found a new environment that was advantageous for it. And that is, I think, how human activity changes our own evolution because we create environments, in this case agriculture, that change the mutation, change the selective pressures. So a mutation that before, or a, an evolutionary change that would not have mattered a million years ago or a hundred thousand years ago, now can make a tremendous difference six thousand years ago. And we think that you know, many mutations that probably uh, make a big difference to our mind function would be completely irrelevant 100,000 years ago, but now in our age of computers or you know, rapid social media, they might actually make a substantial difference. So we may see differences that were invisible, Im irrelevant a million years ago or 100,000 years ago. Is that okay? Um, uh, one more question. Um, well, it's uh, rather obvious how uh, we uh, get information about uh, which is the uh, genome of a particular uh, person. But how do we know uh, when one particular gene is more or less active during the personal development of, uh, say, human, uh, uh, hu uh, human or a monkey? You know, we had the graph. Thank you. Okay, good question. Um, so, uh, of course, we can measure the level of expression of genes by directly assaying the amount of RNA, the amount of the transcript copies that are made from that gene in a sample, if we have it. So if you have fresh blood or fresh muscle or fresh liver, many people are willing to donate such things to science. Uh, most people are not willing to donate their brain. Um, so we always have to get brains from dead people who have willingly, hopefully, do, signed to donate. But they generally don't donate twice. And uh, so we don't really have any direct assay of brain development through time, gene expression. All we have are inferences based on brains we've obtained at different ages. Um, so that is a real limitation in our work. With monkeys, of course, it, we're, it, it's legal to grow them up to a certain age and then kill them, or you can even extract a bit of brain tissue. So you can get it for twice. Thank you. Okay. I think we have some questions way over here who've been waiting a long time. Okay, okay. I'll let you, let you run. Okay. The in Russian. Читали ли вы книгу Тима Тилири «История будущего»? I, I did not, no. Тогда немножко по-другому задам вопрос. Как вы думаете, на... Тогда задам вопрос немножко по-другому. Как вы думаете, на какой стадии находится сейчас эволюция человека и к чему она стремится, каков конец? I, I think this question requires a, a very good bottle of wine. Uh, so... Uh, I give you a very amateur answer, perhaps we can talk a little later, but I think that where we are now is a very transitional state. We like to think of ourselves as somehow the finished product of all of these, you know, six million years since chimpanzees. But one million years from now, our great, 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 great grandchildren will look back at and think how different we were than they are at their time. And I hope they will find us at least admirable. So we are at a transition. I don't know where we will go in a million years. I hope we will become both smarter and better. I don't know that we will. It's not a sure thing. Yes, okay. Скажите, пожалуйста, а существует ли динамика за последние ну 300-400 лет? показателей э, мутации, связанных с, псих, с психологическими, с психическими заболеваниями. И вообще, есть ли рост или стабильный этот показатель, или он уменьшается? То есть, можно ли говорить о каких-то изменениях за последние вот, 
такой период небольшой. Uh, another very hard question, so uh, we should have another bottle of wine. Or <laughs> so, yes, this is, uh, this is really the question that at our institute we are very concerned with um, because uh, it seems that many, uh, very r many really serious disorders like autism or schizophrenia uh, seem to be related to very rare mutations usually not the single nucleotide, not one nucleotide change, but long regions, maybe 1,000, 20,000 bases that are swapped out, deleted, or copied from somewhere else to interrupt a gene. Um, so I guess here is the question, is it that people survive more to have more children with these mutations in the last 400 years? And we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, I think that the mutation rate, we're not sure that it's changed. The accumulation of mutations just reflects that there's been less natural selection, less selection against these mutations. But we are very concerned with the number of rare variants that seem to be associated with psychiatric disease. Um, and we are aware that many more of these rare mutations seem to be occurring now. Not, sorry, I shouldn't say seem to be occurring. They don't occur any faster. It's just that there are many more people and they are not being removed. Um, because, you know, if you, if you talk to your great-great-grandmother, you'll find that life was much harder. Many children died. And, you know, life was unfair, but sometimes people died. People slightly more often died if they had uh, bad mutations. A lot of people died with good genes, but you know that, on average, more people died with bad genes. Now this is not quite happening as much. So it's possible there's a connection, but we we don't know. Okay. Okay. Over here. Well, You've been are, very patient. are there any apes suffering from schizophrenia, or can one think of an ape? Uh, suffering so, or is it an, except, an exclusively human disease? As far as we know, no apes have schizophrenia. Uh, so as far as we know, apes can, you know, can be depressed, they can be anxious, um, but so far as we know, there's no apes with schizophrenia, um, and we're not sure, so that makes us think that well, maybe some recent changes in the human genome have made it possible for us to be schizophrenic. Uh, but we don't know which changes they are. Uh, we've been looking, of course, we're actually doing a project right now where we're trying to look at all of the recently changed regions of the genome to try to identify if there are more mutations there that are related to schizophrenia that seem to occur more in people with schizophrenia than um, occur in controls, in healthy controls. So, yes, the, so as far as we know, there's no apes or mice or dogs with schizophrenia. Okay, yes. Меня интересует такой вопрос, он может быть несколько дилетантский. Вот образ моих мыслей и образ моих действий может ли изменить мой собственный геном вот в течение моей жизни? Да? В течение, ну, в течение этой лекции <смех> вряд ли, наверное, да, но вот в течение моей собственной жизни, если я изменю свой образ мысли, свой образ действий, поменяется ли мой геном? Спасибо. Непонятно вопрос, понятно? Окей. Okay. Uh, uh, your name is Lamarck, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, it would be very nice if that were true. Uh, so far as we know, there are no changes to your DNA, to your bases, caused by how you think. Um, it seems possible that some changes to the epigenetic state of your DNA, that is how open the DNA is or closed and wrapped up, this can be affected by your experience. Um, and there's some people who claim, uh, and I've seen a little evidence, but it's not very good, that uh, a good therapist can sometimes change the epigenetic state of some of your genome. Uh, but uh, shall we say that this is very speculative? 
uh, it makes sense because if you can, you know, you can induce, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, certain kinds of horrible things happen to you, um, and that results in epigenetic changes, DNA methylation of some genes involved in the stress response. Uh, so if that kind of change can harm you, perhaps some other kind of activity can uh, heal that part of you. Seems possible, but uh, you, you couldn't really transmit this to your children. So it might help you, but uh, it wouldn't help your children. Okay? Вы говорили о том, что мутации, которые накапливаются в поколениях, в популяциях, ну, бывают приспособительны к данной среде, и если они приспособительны к данной среде, то они закрепляются и продолжают передаваться с поколения в поколение. Не могли бы вы сказать какие-то примеры мутаций, которые в наше время действительно помогают нам приспособиться к этой среде, но в течение 200-100 лет? Какие-то новые необыкновенные мутации? Okay, uh, I don't think there are any mutations that recent that have spread so widely uh, that help. Though the most recent one I know is this one, which is, uh, you know, um, maybe 6,000 years old. Is there a more recent one? That's a good question. There should be one, but I don't know it. Why don't you uh, get my email address from Anna, you write to me, and I will try to find one, okay? I can't think of one right now. Yes. Question? Yeah. I, and my question is also about ep epigenetics. Um, what is the role of epigenetics in brain development? Do someone assess the rate of methylation, for example, in chimps uh, and in humans in the regions that um, are connected with brain development. C could you say that a, a little differently? So you're asking, what's the role of methylation in brain development? Well, maybe not, not, all, not only methylation. The epi what is the role of epigenetics and brain development? Okay, well, we are writing a paper right now trying to answer that question. Uh, the simple answer is it's very confusing. So the um, first thing is that we notice that the epigenetic state of different parts of the brain rapidly diverges. So that, for example, the cerebellum at the back of the brain has very different epigenetics than the front of the brain, the cortex, and also different epigenetics than the subcortical nuclei, uh, the thalamus, the striatum, the other subcortical nuclei. They're very different DNA methylation profiles and very different uh, chromatin uh, configurations. So we think that it's important for uh, brain development, early brain development, for the uh, chromatin to configure itself in a way that uh, is specific for a particular brain region. Um, but once the brain region is already formed anatomically, it seems that most brain regions, and this is something very new, we're just finding it out these past few months, it seems that most of the cortical regions then converge. So the, uh, the epigenetics seems to be necessary to form the initial architecture. And then many of them converge to a similar kind of epigenetic profile. Uh, we are also looking at individual differences. And that, I'm not sure that was what you were asking. But it seems that uh, during the aging process, many, many genes, in fact, our students at the course on genomic data analysis just today have been analyzing the data showing how the methylation of many genes in the brain changes as you age. Uh, and this may have something to do with the loss of synaptic plasticity. So perhaps if we can change that, we may be able to recover some brain function in older people. This would be very nice. Um, but so far it's just a hope, but it's clear. Yes. Первый человек появился в районе экватора, поскольку там самая сильная солнечная радиация. Именно оттуда пошел э, распространяться человек. Таким образом, можно сделать вывод, что именно под воздействием радиации э, ну, происходит улучшение генома человека. И вот теперь, если оставить в сторону нравственную сторону, нравственную оставить в сторону, то в случае с Японией если воспринимать как на, научный эксперимент, он принес пользу вот этой популяции, поскольку там сейчас очень высокоразвитая популяция. Так, 
пользу принес случай вот атомной бомбардировки или отрицательно? Спасибо. I'm not quite sure I understand your question. I think you're asking, was it a negative or positive that, the, uh, that they acquired white, white skin? Is that correct? No? When people spread out? I, I didn't quite understand the question. Ah, a nuclear. Ah, okay. I, I see. Well, I think we can say it was negative because uh, almost all of those mutations that were induced were harmful. Perhaps a very few were helpful, but we don't know. So it's possible a few were helpful uh, to uh, some of those individuals and maybe they will pass on useful mutations. But uh, usually almost all the mutations that have an effect have a bad effect. Um, so maybe 10% of them perhaps might be helpful and maybe 50% or 60% are neutral, it doesn't matter, and maybe 30 or 40% are really harmful. So probably on average it's a bad thing, but for a few people it might have been a good thing. Maybe two or three. Okay? Next question. Разрешите задать. Если посмотреть на последние, там, может быть, 30, может быть, 100 лет, но в сравнении вот с глобальной там, предшествующей историей, вот мы живем в такое беспечное, безмятежное время, питаем наш мозг коктейлем из эндорофинов, допаминов в несопоставимо больших количествах, чем, я думаю, это могли позволить себе наши дедушки и бабушки. Какие-то стрессовые действительно Реальные стрессовые ситуации, они игровые, где они как там в компьютерной игре или еще где-то, их у нас все меньше. И мы пропускаем феноменальное количество информации, обрабатываем феноменальное количество информации каждый день. Просто с каждой секунды, каждой минуты, визуальные, очень разнообразные, текстуальные и так далее. Есть ли какой-то инструмент, есть ли какие-то эксперименты, которые бы действительно могли подтвердить, каким образом происходит генетическая мутация ну, в поколениях, по крайней мере. То есть действительно ли ваш тезис о том, что а, а, культур, ну, вот воздействие, возможность именно мозгу об, обрабатывать культуру, ну, то, что приносится культурой, и таким образом опосредованно через культуру менять себя и менять геном, а можем ли мы сейчас как-то зримо на уровне биомолекулярном видеть, что вот действительно, грубо говоря, вот, не знаю, мы там или я, там, человек совершенно, там, ну, грубо говоря, поколение порно, поколение, ну там, у моих, у моих родителей было 7 детей, у меня один ребенок и будет еще максимум два, то есть со стиральной машиной очень вольготной, легкой жизнью, вот действительно можно зарегистрировать что-то существенное, что происходит на биомолекулярном уровне? Или пока что это больше спекуляции и такие эссеистические рассуждения? Well, I think we would have to measure your genome. And then we could perhaps say. But we would have to put it in the context of thousands of other genomes and see, you know, which stress response genes um, are different and which people have more children. Uh, I think this is not happening now. It won't happen next year, but I think it's entirely possible that this could be done in 10 years. Uh, I think many people will have personal genomes in 10 years, and it will be very easy to do the kind of study where you say, well, let's find out how a person's stress response genes are predictive of how many children they will have, which is a very stressful occupation, I understand. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Well, I'll s I see probably at least three major issues um, associated with the topic that you touched upon uh, in the lecture. And, uh, um, well, one of those questions would definitely require a bottle of wine, the other possibly a bottle of wa va vodka, you'll be the judge. So the first one is, probably sounds very heretical to your scientific mind, which is there are plenty of um, considerations leading to the point that not 
all of the mind activity is seated necessarily in the brain or even in the uh, body in its entirety. Therefore, I mean, it sounds pretty offensive to your uh, uh, psychiatric profession, but that point of view is not completely extraneous to what you were discussing. That's number one. Uh, should I? Why do, yeah, why don't you give number two and then I will respond okay. to both. A number two is um, in terms of um, verification procedures when it comes to any connection between um, possibility of mutations or uh, certain aspects of genetic structures that you could view somehow through the technology available as of now and the actual evolutionary um, evolutionary effects, let's put it this way. So to me, it all seems extraordinarily fuzzy. I'm sorry, but I might be wrong, but that's what it sounds like. In other words, there might be some connections, but who knows, and again. Well, let me uh, respond to your first point. And the point. third question would be just that point, yes. It's just what? The third question, there are three issues. Okay, well, why don't you say your third, and then I'll try All right, off. no problem. <laughs> um, number three is, um, when it comes to genetic engineering, there are tough bioethics issues, which you, if not discussed, but at least um, mentioned. So that depends on a variety of factors, uh, which some are uh, political, financial. Let's, for example, take the leading scientific institutions, I guess one of which you represent, one of which you work for, come from Canada to Virginia, right? And a certain um, advanced cultures, advanced countries have definitely, um, if not the last say, but enormous uh, cloud when it comes to those kind of considerations. Well, what's your question? So, so my question is how do we define who is to judge? Well, I think that that is a political question, so I will agree with you there. It's uh, a hard political question, and um, I think it will depend on developing a good politics, you know, good social process for making those decisions. Uh, I agree that it's very possible that people will make decisions who have not the best interests of humanity at heart. Um, I think about your second point, I think we do we have at this point only indirect evidence because as as I said people don't generally donate pieces of their brain over time so that we can't always follow everything so we are in making inferences and it's possible to to criticize I think most people are doing a fair job of trying to make inferences based on on good evidence but it's admittedly all about the human brain it's almost all indirect evidence um, and I'm forgetting the first point was, what was the first point? Oh, yes. Um, well, I, as you might expect, I disagree with you. I, I think there's, uh, at least the evidence that I've looked at, uh, suggests that if we are to understand what else is needed besides our brain, it's social interaction. It's other people who make our brains into our minds. And uh, it's that experience of working with other people through joint attention processes and, and other things that makes a mind out of a brain. And uh, I think, uh, I, I haven't seen any evidence that we need any spooky processes, but I would agree with you that we definitely need more than, if you will, the pure materialist viewpoint that it's only in the brain. So I have very many disagreements with my colleagues about uh, whether 
all of the answers are just to be found in the brain. I think there's a lot of answers to be found in studying interaction. So let's take one more question here. Yes. You better turn that on. Maybe me. <laughs> Ну, как мне известно, основные поведенческие альтруизм и эгоизм определяются именно геномом человека. То есть, и отсюда вопрос: в течение всего то есть, эволюции человека, какое из этих проявлений человеческого поведения, то есть на себя или на общество, было более, так сказать, ну, превалировало? И куда, если есть данные, будет идти? То есть на себя или все-таки социальная какая-то структура? Okay, two very hard questions in that. Uh, I think that uh, human behavior has evolved right at the edge of being egotistical and social. Uh, if I can flip ahead to a slide I didn't show here. Uh, yeah, here we are. Um, the, uh, a key ingredient, I think, uh, that has maintained the very un usual push toward social development in human beings, uh, as opposed to most animals where selfishness is more evolutionarily successful, has been the um, assortment, the free assortment of people with people with the same degree of cooperation. This picture is from a recent paper in Nature just a few months ago, uh, which went back to these people, the Hadza people, who are hunter-gatherers in Tanzania. and um, they are asking exactly this question. So we have some theoretical models. You know, most evolutionists think it's impossible to develop altruistic behavior unless you have kin selection, unless you have everybody sharing the genes. Uh, so why is it that human beings seem to have evolved cooperative behavior even though they are mostly living with non-kin? You know, they live with a few family members, but mostly they live with non-kin. So it seems that the key ingredient in the theoretical studies was the ability of people to find other cooperators. They, they weren't stuck. All of the classical evolutionary models, the ones that Richard Dawkins, for example, is very fond of, assumes that people are stuck with the group they are. And then it makes no sense. If you are stuck, you should just adapt and be as selfish as you can get away with in the, in the group. But if you are free to move to find other people who are better, then you can bring out the best in yourself. Uh, I think is the short answer. So where will we go? I think that very much depends on how, again, how we develop our society. And that is also a bottle of wine question. <laughs> yes, okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Uh, if we assume that uh, Homo sapiens, someone eventually will evolve into a new species, what could be somatic and mental features of this species and when it can happen. And the second question, why Homo sapiens does not have genes like those ones that enable a lizard to regenerate its tail if it loses it? Uh, you know, I think it would be easier to answer the second one. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, why don't I try that one? Uh, we actually do have most of those same genes. It's just that they don't work together very effectively. Our organs are somewhat more complex than a lizard's organs. So there's, many, there's more different cell types. Um, and it's just harder to get the whole developmental program restarted. So if you cut off a lizard's leg, you can restart much of the developmental program uh, and then grow most of a limb again. It's not quite as good, but it's, it's, it's often OK. Uh, our developmental programs are just too complex and they usually s are depend on a particular environment, whereas the lizards are pretty much independent, so that's why we can't do that. What will we look like in a thousand years? Maybe sort of like today. In a million years? I have no idea. Okay, you had a question over here, I think. Считаете ли вы, что с того момента, как возник вид Homo sapiens, То есть возник социальный вид в животном мире. Мозг человека уже в какой-то степени за 100 тысяч лет примерно это произошло, деградировал. No, I don't think so. I think that the conditions of 
ever-increasing challenge where human beings had to do harder and harder things. Uh, so, for example, uh, about uh, 40 or 50,000 years ago in the Middle East, all of the large animals, the hippopotami, the elephants, they all died off, probably because our ancestors killed them all. But um, they were all no more big packages of meat to be hunted. So our ancestors had to become uh, hunters of smaller animals. But smaller animals are faster, and they don't give as much. You have to work harder. You have to be smarter. So there, we see at the same time as the dying of all of the hippopotamuses and the elephants, we see replacement of the toolkit. We see that human beings made, made the leap. They took on the challenge and they made uh, themselves smarter, or they, you know, the ones who were smarter had more children because it was harder to get animal food. So I think that, no, we didn't become stupider. Uh, now, you know, whether, you know, a steady diet of video games... Huh? Uh, well, it's not Lamarck, it's selection. So those who could learn, who had the potential to learn from others and to improve, they became they became the survivors and the progenitors. Oh, well, we'll have an argument sometime. Okay, one last question here. Um, can you please tell us whether there are some bright examples which can show us uh, the evolution of our brains uh, in uh, recent uh, maybe 10,000 years, uh, which is influenced by changes in our genes? I mean, something that we could see um, brightly, the difference between Homo sapiens, which uh, lived um, 10,000 years ago, and a modern human. Maybe something which is connected with uh, our perceive of information or anything. Okay, I can't give you one for 10,000 years. I can give you one for 50,000 years. Uh, and that is the DRD4, uh, it's a dopamine D4 receptor. If you look that up, you'll find that there is a recent mutation in that receptor that uh, has become very widespread in the past 50,000 years. It uh, affects information processing because, uh, it's oddly enough, it's the one that is implicated in attention deficit disorder. It's very popular in America. I don't know if you have it here. Uh, so uh, it means that you're perhaps less likely to be able to concentrate. You are easily hearing things in the trees. You are uh, paying attention to a variety of different things. If you think about it, what happened 50,000 years ago, our ancestors are stepping out from Africa, they're starting to explore the world, going into all different environments, new environments they've never been in before. They have to be attentive to everything that happens. This particular mutation turns out is very high in jungle living people. So you can figure that out, you know. That's a jungle is a place where you really need to be on the lookout for any unexpected sound. So that's one, you can look up DRD4 receptor. Um, as far as anatomy is concerned, you don't see any anatomical differences between brains of people 10,000 years ago and brains today. Uh, broadly speaking, you know, you know the Neanderthals had bigger brains than we did, um, but broadly speaking, over the last 10,000 years, there's relatively little change in brain appearance. Okay, I think we should bring it to a close here. Thank you for your attention and putting up with me in a foreign language. So, thank you for your question. <laughs>